uh, hyper obsessive, uh, often socially challenged <laughs> uh, geeks. Okay, someone who's really uh, obsessed with particularly Japanese pop culture and the dolls and the figurines and the animation and the costumes. And just obsessed uh, beyond uh, beyond reason. Um, I may be an otaku of other things, but I am not an otaku of, of anime and manga. I was, however, fascinated to meet and interview both Japanese fans and American fans, uh, Japanese artists, American artists, producers on both sides of the ocean as well. So for me, it was uh, really a thrilling journey uh, into discovering not only, of course, uh, Japan, the country of my mother's uh, birth, uh, but also discovering how interconnected these two cultures are, the American and the Japanese culture. And I think it's, um, in many ways, it's an alliance that may be the most important strategically to the United States uh, right now. And uh, perhaps as a sign of this, many of you may know that the new president uh, of the United States uh, sent his new Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, uh, to Japan uh, on her first trip outside of the United States. And the very first uh, foreign head of state to visit the Obama White House uh, was Japanese Prime Minister Taro Aso. So certainly the new administration is treating Japan right now as a very, very close friend and ally in the 21st century. So I'm just going to read a few pages from the introduction of the book to get you a sense of the flavor. Uh, I, um, there's a segment of the book on, uh, let's say, erotic manga and anime, <laughs> which I had to write because so many people say to me, or so many people said to me, and my editor said to me, you got to address this thing, like, what, what's going on with all that, <laughs> all that sexy stuff? Uh, but I'm not going to read from that chapter. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> A few years ago, I flew from New York to Los Angeles to visit some friends and conduct an interview for a story I was writing. I had recently flown from Tokyo to New York, and Japan was fresh on my mind. At the time, my friends, a husband and wife with a four-year-old daughter, lived in Los Angeles' Echo Park neighborhood. The area was gentrifying fast. Hipsters and artists were moving in, rents were rising, cafes cropping up on corners and side streets. We walked with their daughter in nearby Elysian Park, where you could see both the Los Angeles skyline and Dodger Stadium. Their house had a Japanese look and feel to it, smooth wood surfaces, subdued hues, straight lines, set back from the street on a hill and obscured uh, from view by a bank of shrubs and a bamboo grove. But the Japanese look and feel was purely coincidental. Urbane and highly educated professionals, my friends were planning to move into a new home shortly. <coughs> Neither of them has a Japanese background, or any other reason to be focused on the culture. Their house, in fact, was a temporary landing pad. One evening, I sat in the living room with their daughter, watching the sun, setting sun through the bamboo stalks beyond the window. Suddenly, she began to cry. Her parents were rushing to prepare dinner in the kitchen and dining room behind us. I tried to console her myself, making silly faces and asking her about one of her dolls. I failed. <laughs> Soon, she was wailing, and I felt helpless. Her mother swept gracefully into the room, calm as a mother, voice hushed and soothing. Some version of, there, there, honey, is what she said. And then, do you want to watch Totoro? <laughs> I thought I had misheard her, but it was not the appropriate time to ask an intrusive question. And when director Hayao Miyazaki's densely verdant countryside filled their widescreen TV, I knew that I had not. Their daughter was entranced leaning forward on the sofa, eyes wide as the tears dried on her cheeks, her mouth a slack oval. Miyazaki's plucky sisters and persevering, bushy-haired father came into view, and she uh-ohed and then giggled along with them, uttering some of the lines in un unison with the animated figures on the screen. It's the only thing that settles her down when she's really upset, my friend explained, shrugging. She absolutely loves Totoro, and we do too. I'm saying Totoro in a <laughs> roughly Japanese way. <laughs> she said Totoro, of course. <laughs> I used to tell my American friends that America seemed surprisingly close to me whenever I stayed in Japan, even before high-speed internet access went from being a luxury uh, to being a necessity. 
The Japanese media is notably America-centered, partly because U.S. military bases still <coughs> occupy enormous plots of an already crowded archipelago, and partly because America has a position as role model for the post-war generation. The Japanese who had survived the bombs and heard their emperor declare defeat sought to rise from the ashes of World War II and saw in their former conqueror possibilities for material and social wealth and well-being. American fast food restaurants and brand names are omnipresent in Japan's urban centers. With slightly less buzz and fanfare, a growing number of mainstream Hollywood movies open on or near their premieres in America. In fact, Spider-Man 3 opened in Japan before it opened in America. And CDs by American or English artists are sometimes even released earlier in Japan, where enormous tower records or HMV outlets prominently feature them, along with massive back catalogs. In fact, Tower Records, which, as many of you know, no longer exists in the United States, is still, last time I checked, going quite strong in Japan. So you can go to Tower Records in Tokyo, but not here in New York City. <laughs> in fact, until the deeper linguistic and cultural differences between the Japanese and other nationals become apparent, it is not uncommon to detect a tone of faint disappointment in the voices of first-time visitors who have landed expecting and hoping for something more exotic. I used to say that Japan seemed very distant whenever I returned to the United States. American newscasts are generally focused on the 50 states, venturing overseas only for wars, natural disasters, or to dog the president with questions about foreign affairs. The occasional story about a foreign culture's quirky traditions might appear near the end of a newscast, but international stories of any stripe, and especially those about a land as far from U.S. shores as Japan, generally receive short shrift. The Nikkei rose or fell, a typhoon tore through Tokyo, that's about it. But that has begun to change, and I began to notice the shift in the early years of this century. There is still an enormous imbalance of attention, of course. America dominates the global discourse for reasons good and bad in positive and negative ways. But since that evening in uh, Los Angeles, I have started seeing a lot more copies of My Neighbor Totoro and other Miyazaki films in American friends' living rooms and also seeing more Pokemon figures on the sides of buses, more Akira posters on college campuses, and more Japanese or Japanese-influenced titles of all types on American television. Though I am naturally more sensitive to them, references to Japan as having a cool or attractive culture are not likely to surprise anyone in the 21st century. The questions are, why Japan and why now? So, just to summarize quickly, this book is an attempt actually to explore what I call the third wave of Japanophilia. Uh, you can go trace back to the 18th the 19th centuries when European artists in particular uh, <coughs> discovered artists such as Hiroshige and Hokusai and the woodblock print. And of course, Van Gogh most famously was heavily influenced by Japanese artists and their approach to particularly the approach to the use of line and manipulating line in an illustration as opposed to uh, chiaroscuro or depth perception. Uh, then again, there was a boom in the 1950s when the beatniks and uh, uh, poets and writers became um, immersed in Japanese haiku poetry, the art of Zen. Uh, the, probably the best example is uh, uh, in terms of poetry, it was Ezra Pound who got into Japanese and Chinese poetry and uh, tried to influence uh, T.S. Eliot in those directions. So there was a boom in the 1950s of interest in Japan, but what distinguishes the current boom, and this is what I tried to address in the book, is that it's a real fascination with the products of contemporary Japanese culture. So instead of <coughs> Ikebana, flower arranging, or Zen, or the art of the tea ceremony, current Americans and Europeans, of course, are fascinated with the art of contemporary Japan. What's happening in fashion on the streets of Harajuku, which is a, a, a hip neighborhood in Tokyo? What's happening, uh, what are the latest in uh, uh, cuisines coming out of Japan and how we can uh, mm. adopt those in American restaurants? Uh, and of course, what's happening in manga and anime and to a rising extent, popular music uh, and style, graphic design. So the interest today on behalf of the West in general is targeted at contemporary Japan, and that's a comparatively new 